All right, so just to start off with, um, just want to be transparent with you all. I'm obviously not a pathologist, very far from it, in fact. I'm not an expert in this stuff, but I do consider myself an expert in material that's high yield for the purposes of board exams. So that should be enough for all of you, hopefully. All right, so without further ado, I have to give credit to Dr. Michael Sass, who's the pathologist or the pathology instructor at our school until this past year. Uh, a lot of these slides are just adapted from his um, presentation, basically made more high yield, and I removed a lot of them, Minusha. All right, so just to start off with a quick history lesson. Uh, so this is the high yield trifecta that we're all familiar with. Uh, U-World First Aid, Pathomar, UFAP, as we all uh, like to call it. But actually, there's a bit more history behind it. So I hope at least a few of you recognize Dr. Golyan here, uh, Edward Golyan. He's the godfather of high yield information. Um, if you don't know who he is, um, you probably should. Um, I don't have a whole lot else to say about it besides I just wanted to pay homage to him. All right, so just some objectives we're going to cover here. Uh, that should say objective, not objects. I don't know why it says that. So here real quick, uh, so the diverticuli are pretty simple for the most part. I just think of a diverticulum as a pouch that's coming out of your lumen. Um, and then there's obviously some variations here. So a true diverticulum, you have all the layers of your gut pouch coming out. So your mucosa, your submucosa, and your muscularis layer. Uh, and this distinction becomes really important here, especially for board exam purposes. So for example, we're gonna talk about Meckel's diverticulum. Uh, that's a true diverticulum, meaning all of its layers come out. And then the appendix, uh, we don't really think of it, quote unquote, as a diverticulum, but it's a physiologic diverticulum. It should be there. Whereas a Meckel's diverticulum or some of the other things we're gonna be talking about are pathologic diverticulums. So just remember, just because you see the word diverticulum, it doesn't mean it's necessarily a pathology. A diverticulum is just describing an anatomical uh, structure. And then accordingly, if we have a true diverticulum, we also have false diverticulum. Um, and these are basically just your mucosa and submucosa are coming out. And hopefully you remember talking about Zanker's diverticulums. I believe last week you guys talked about um, upper GI pathology. And these are also known as pseudodiverticulums. Um, so again, just real quick here, diverticulosis has very classic uh, features here. You basically just have out pouching um, of your layers and they kind of look like polyps. But one thing I want to point out to all of you is that diverticuli and polyps can look very similar and deceiving in a picture like this. But just remember that polyps go into the lumen and diverticuli pop out of the lumen. Because if you see a picture like this, especially if there's tons of them, it can be kind of confusing. Like, are these tons of polyps or are these diverticuli? So just pay attention to where the lumen's at. It can be very, uh, very uh, deceiving how some of these pictures might present. I know these look simple enough and it's easy to tell, but depending on the pictures you might get on UWorld or your exams, it's not always that simple. Um, so diverticulosis is basically just having a bunch of diverticulum. Um, it's very common. More than half people over 60 years old have it. There's a lot of risk factors for it, but it's basically all the things that would cause constipation. And if you think about it, that makes sense because diverticulum basically arrives when you have increased intraluminal pressure and it identifies areas of focal weakness that eventually outpouch and cause these diverticulum. Um, one thing I want to point out, and it's really high yield for your board exams, is that most often these are asymptomatic. Diverticulosis, um, you, most people are walking around with it, have no idea that they have diverticulosis. Um, there are some symptoms of it that can present, but it's really in the minority of people with, di with diverticulosis. And what you mainly get is painless hematopoiesia. Basically, you're stretching all those vessels inside those diverticuli, and they tend to rupture and bleed. That's why you get painless hematopoiesia. You can't have vague discomforts. And then it can present or progress to what we call diverticulitis or inflammation of them. But these are all considered complications. They're not like classic symptoms that everyone with diverticulosis is walking around with. If you take anything away from this, just be that most often they're asymptomatic. If it does present, it's 
most likely going to be painless hematochesia or just some vague discomfort. All right. So then diverticulitis, as the name implies, is just inflammation of those diverticulums. And basically think about it as appendicitis, but on the left side. So instead of right lower quadrant pain, you have left lower quadrant pain. You have leukocytosis, obviously predominantly neutrophilic. And you have fever. Uh, again, all the symptoms of appendicitis just on the opposite side. And there's a bunch of complications of diverticulitis. And in fact, it's actually the most common cause of fistulas. Um, so as you might remember, fistulas are just aberrant connections between two lumens. Um, and the most common fistula that presents with diverticulitis is a colovesical fistula. The colo, obviously colon, vesicle meaning your bladder. So basically what you have is... Um, gas from your bowels that comes out of your uh, urethra. Um, and that's how it would present. But there's also a bunch of other fistulas that can present, and we'll be talking about more of them here later. Um, but just remember that obstruction, um, whenever you get obstruction and inflammation, uh, you have a bunch of these neutrophils and white blood cells that are um, encompassing this area. And I'll show you a picture here next of some more normal looking features, but this is all, this all shouldn't be here. This is basically just a diverticuli. It should mostly just be empty, but this is acute diverticulitis. So you have a bunch of this inflammatory material um, in the middle of it. And treatment for diverticulitis is usually just antibiotics. Um, and that usually takes care of it unless you have one of these complications, obviously. All right. So in here, here what you see is just for the most part, a normal diverticuli, but I want to draw your attention to the right side of this image. So obviously, if you'll notice, this was way different. Uh, you have a lot of hypercellularity here. You have a lot of lymphoid aggregates accumulating along the epithelium here. Uh, oops, sorry. And that obviously takes a lot of time to develop. If you look back at this image here, this is acute diverticulitis. It's not a chronic process, and we can tell that because there's not a whole bunch of lymphoid aggregates uh, and hypercellularity around the outside of it. But here, there obviously is. So, uh, it sort of illustrates the chronic process of that reticulitis. And then, okay, so this is one of the most high yield um, diverticulums that you'll probably be presented with. Meckel's diverticulum, uh, it's a congenital malformation of your GI tract, and specifically, it's of your persistence of your vitamin duct, which in other words, is your fallow mesenteric duct, uh, same thing. Uh, and again, we mentioned this was a true diverticulum. Um, again, remember, true diverticulum means you have your mucosa, submucosa, and your muscularis layers coming out. Whereas in the false diverticulum, you only have your mucosa and submucosa. And probably one of the biggest takeaways from this is that it has a lot of ectopic um, cells in it. So most commonly you have this acid secreting cells that will present inside um, this diverticulum. Or you can have some pancreatic tissue, but that's less common. It's usually acid secreting gastric mucosa that ends up in this diverticulum. And then I'm assuming you guys have probably watched Pathoma before this, but I don't, I'm pretty sure he mentions the rule of twos there as well. Uh, there's some variations to this, but basically it's two times more common in males about two feet from the ileocecal valve, 2% of the population, roughly two inches long, but it can be smaller, a bit larger, and then it commonly presents in the first two years of life. So not hard and fast rules, but it just helps you remember some of the features of it. So probably the biggest high yield board exam takeaway from Meckel's diverticulum is the diagnosis and presentation of it. So like we mentioned for diverticulosis, which is mostly in older people, uh, this presents fairly similarly sometimes. You basically have spontaneous but painless GI bleeding. So painless hematochesia, in other words. Um, and then board exams love asking about the protechnitate scan. So that's basically called the Meckel scan, and that's how you diagnose a Meckel's diverticulum. You basically do the scan. I don't have an image of it here, but it just shows an area of foci where the Meckel's diverticulum is at and that header, where that heterotopic um, mucosa is at. Uh, and it's very classically in your peri-umbilical and right lower quadrant area. 
almost always pairing though, because uh, if you ever see a question and in the answer or in the scan, it's showing you a picture of some weird looking scan and there's just an area around the umbilical area that lights up, it's probably talking about a meclose diverticulum, most likely, uh, if you're just playing odds. Um, so next thing, just wanted to quickly mention here is angiodysplasia, not the highest yield thing, but one of the, there's a quick tie-in with this with board exams, but it's basically just malformed mucosa and submucosa. You basically have vessels, vessels where there shouldn't be or more vessels uh, present in an area uh, that they shouldn't be present in. And as you might expect, if you have a lot of these blood vessels somewhere that they're not supposed to be, they tend to bleed. And that's what the takeaway I want you to remember from this. So let's just recap real quick. If you have a toddler with painless hematochesia, you want to consider Meckel's diverticulum. But if you have a grown adult, let's say 60 years or older, with painless hematochesia, first thing you want to consider is diverticulosis. That's the most common cause of painless hematochesia in an older person. Second thing you want to consider is angiodysplasia. Uh, it's a number two cause of painless hematochesia in older adults. So again, sixth decade of life or older. And it's very, it can be very chronic nature or depending on how acute the rupture is, it can be hyperacute as well. Uh, it just depends how big those vessels are and uh, the pattern at which they're going to burst at. It could be very slow and small or it could be all of a sudden all at once and you're obviously in a very bad situation there. All right. Also, feel free to ask any questions. I should have said that at the beginning if you have any, obviously. I have the chat open here as well, or you can just open your mic and ask as well. All right. So Hirschsprung's disease, another um, question that board examiners just love to go after. Um, and it's basically a congenital megacolon uh, being caused by absence of nerve, basically nerve cells in your distal colon are beginning in cells, in other words. And, okay, so it's due to failure of your neural crest migration. And one thing I want to point out about neural crest migration is that this occurs in a cranial to caudal um, pattern. So it starts up top and then these migrate all the way down towards the end of the GI tract. So if you just keep that in mind, it will make sense why uh, some of these next things happen. So it presents, you basically have failure to pass your meconium. Uh, depending on how bad it is, it could actually present in much older children, just as chronic constipation. Uh, you have, this is just a genetic tie-in. Everyone hates genetics, but it shows up on exams. Uh, increasing board exams. And then, okay, so one second. Yeah, so your rectum is always involved. And your sigmoid colon is 75% of the time involved. So this ties us back to this first point I was mentioning. But neural crest migration happened in a caudal fashion. So you're always going to end up um, innervating and you're going to have proper ganglion cells inside your proximal colon. But once it starts reaching here, for whatever reason, this mutation causes it to stop progressing. And it stops usually around right here. And you don't end up getting innervation with ganglion cells over here, or you don't get, end up with ganglion cells over here. And that's obviously a problem, but it would make sense why you always have distal involvement, but you don't necessarily have proximal involvement. It kind of just depends where those neural crest cells stop migrating due to the mutation. So again, just remember distal rectum always involved. Proximally, it's possible for it to be involved. Sigmoid is usually involved, but pretty much anything um, proximal to that probably not going to be involved there. Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, I know no one likes embryology. It sucks. But it's a very simple concept can help you remember the pattern that Hirschsprung disease can present in. And your diagnosis is pretty simple. Uh, this is what they're showing is a barium enema, basically just shooting a barium and visualizing what uh, these structures look like. And as you can see, this is why they call it a megacolon, because this colon is a lot larger than it should be. Uh, and you have this transition zone where you can clearly tell this is not dilated over here on uh, your rectum. It's not in part of your sigmoid. It's not either in this, in this image. All right, so acute appendicitis. We all know about appendicitis. We know how it presents and 
basic workup and whatnot of it. Um, there's, but there are some takeaways I want us to highlight here. So uh, obviously we all know about the appendix. We mentioned earlier how it's a true diverticulum. It's a physiologic diverticulum. It should be present, present in everyone. Uh, clinical presentation, I think we all know the perineum umbilical, which ends up going off to the right lower quadrant to make Bernie's sign, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what we don't necessarily know about is the neoplasms of the appendix, which are surprisingly kind of high yield. So carcinoid tumors are very common um, in your appendix, but the most important thing I want you to remember from this is it's almost always benign. Most people with these have no idea that they have them and they're never gonna have any idea that they have these tumors. Most of these carcinoid tumors of your appendix completely benign don't ever present um, with any um, with any symptoms at all, unless obviously you have complications. I don't know what the exact statistics of it are, but it's insanely more prevalent than one might imagine uh, because it's just asymptomatic. Your appendix isn't really... I don't really know what your appendix does, to be honest, and I don't think anyone fully understands why it's there, but uh, it, and it makes sense that a benign tumor of it would not really be uh, commonly... Uh, recognized. Oh, so I missed a question here a couple of minutes ago. Is that colon vesicular fistula the same for both men and women? Yeah, so it should be the same for both men and women, depending on the anatomy of it, because um, it's just connecting your colon with your bladder. Um, you can also have cholourethral fistulas, and those obviously are widely different with men and women, since obviously our urethras are considerably different. Um, but as far as the colovesicular fistula goes, the presentation for it should be about the same for both men and women. Hopefully that answered that question. All right. So just real quick about obstruction. There's a couple common causes of it, necromias, adhesions, volvulus, and intestinal which we're all going to go into in a little bit more detail. But one thing I wanted to point out about Obstructions is that, does everyone here know the difference between constipation and obstipation? There's a very distinct difference and it's actually incredibly important. And if you haven't heard of the word obstipation, basically what it means is constipation, except you can't pass gas either. And this is a very high yield concept. If you mention this on words next year or when you're on like general surgery or something or with GI, they're going to be very impressed that you're using the word obstipation. So obstipation is just constipation, in, except you can't pass gas either. And the reason this is important is because you can have partial obstructions, but you can also have full obstructions where even gas can't get through. And if you can imagine, that would be incredibly dangerous because you're basically having pressure build up on one, on one end of your colon that can't be relieved. That can lead to a lot of problems i.e. perforation, and obviously sepsis after that. So you always want to ask, not only are you constipated when your last bowel movement was, but if you're thinking of obstruction or something similar to it, you want to ask, can you pass gas or not? Um, that's a very important follow-up question that all of you should uh, definitely remember. Uh, if not for board exams, you're definitely going to impress some people um, next year when you're on rotations, if you remember that. So, okay, so the most common cause worldwide of obstructions is hernias. Um, we're all familiar with hernias. I'm not going to go into that much detail about them. Uh, it's basically protrusion of your serosa line peritoneal pouch through a weakness in your abdominal wall. But one thing I do want to highlight is these two words, which I don't really think were emphasized enough in your first year curriculum. But again, like the word obstipation, you're really going to impress people if you know the difference between these two next year when you're talking um, to your attendings and residents. So an incarcerated hernia is basically a hernia, as the name implies, that you can't push back into your abdomen or pelvis. Uh, this is the less serious of the two types of, or two classifications of hernias here. But a strangulated hernia, this is like acutely dangerous. You basically have blood supply that's compromised. Um, and as one might imagine, when blood supply is compromised, you have ischemia, necrosis, and that can lead to a whole bunch of other problems. So 
know the difference between incarcerated and strangulated hernias. <clears throat> and obviously there's direct hernias, indirect hernias, femoral hernias. Um, you all covered that in first year. I wouldn't expect it to come up in that much detail in this exam, but again, I, I can't be for sure. But you will have to know it for your board exams, so maybe like a couple weeks before step one, just go back and review them. They're pretty simple if you um, if you just follow some of the mnemonics and like first aid and whatnot. Um, but at this point, don't really worry about them. Just kind of understand that all is you know. Are there physical, oh, it's another question. Are there physical exam signs that help you differentiate between the two? Yeah, good question. So you can have both of the, and a, a hernia can be both incarcerated and strangulated. Um, but a strangulated hernia is going to present, your patient's going to be extremely toxic. They're going to be like writhing around in pain. Um, they might have like a really high fever, like peritonitis, where you can just like touch them very lightly on their stomach and they're going to jump out of the bed. Uh, it's a very acute process. Whereas incarcerated hernia, if it's not strangulated, you could honestly just be walking around with it. I mean, one of us could just be walking around with an incarcerated hernia um, without much pain. If there's no um, compromise of your blood supply, it's basically just part of your bowel that's not in your abdomen. Um, so that's kind of how you would differentiate. And just based on presentation, um, incarcerated, not necessarily very acutely um, concerning. Uh, you could even leave it untreated depending on the extent of it. Um, so good question. So then the next cause of obstruction we're going to talk about is adhesions. Uh, these are pretty simple, just fibrous bands that result from prior surgeries or inflammatory processes. We can talk about some of those, but not a whole lot to say about them. They can lead to obstruction though. So volvulus is basically, as this picture implies, just twisting of your bowel. It's a very rare cause of obstruction, but it can be a cause of it. If you have an elderly patient with it, just think of your sigmoid colon is most likely the area where it's happening. And then if it's young adults, think of your cecum, which is involved. Not a whole lot else to say about these. So then intussusception, um, it's basically telescoping a one bowel segment into another bowel segment. And it's commonly at your ileocecal junction. Um, and one important high yield step one thing I want to mention here is that compromising of your blood supply is what leads to the pain. And the pain is actually usually intermittent. Um, the pain usually only occurs when you have peristalsis. Because when you have peristalsis, that's when this um, telescope bowel segment really pushes itself in and acutely and very temporarily have um, compromising of your blood supply, which is what leads to the pain. So it's a very, it can be a very intermittent pain that occurs like every couple minutes, couple hours, just sort of depending on what your bowel habits are like at the time. Um, so it's not necessarily chronic pain. Um, if you have like colicky um, bowel or abdominal pain, you definitely want to be thinking of intussusception. Um, and another buzzword that step one loves to mention for this is currant jelly dark stools. It's basically just blood in your dark stools that looks like currant jelly, kind of like the buzzword for Klebsiella. Um, and there's usually a lead point that causes this to be pulled through. In children's, it's either Meckel's diverticulum or it could just be lymphoid hyperplasia, which can be caused by any simple infection. So anything that causes your lymph nodes in your bowel, um, i.e. your Peyer's patches to get uh, enlarged can cause a lead point. Um, and then in adults, it's usually a master tumor. That's the lead point. So malabsorptive symptoms, um, these are really high yield. I think we all can recognize a clinical presentation of malabsorptive symptoms, um, diarrhea, steatorrhea, weight loss, et cetera, et cetera, and all sorts of nutrient deficiencies. Uh, but one thing I want to point out about fat absorption is that there are three components to fat absorption. Uh, the first one is your pancreas. Uh, it supplies, obviously, enzymes to break down things like long fatty acids. Um, we're not talking about pancreas stuff today. Uh, this is lower GI fat. 
The second thing that um, aids in fat absorption is your bile salts. Uh, those are obviously produced by your liver, stored in your gallbladder, and they basically emulsify these fats and allow for absorption of them. Again, made in the liver, or stored in the gallbladder. We're not talking about them today. But the third component of fat absorption is your villi. So your villi and your small intestines are really what increase your surface area and allow you to absorb all this, all these nutrients. And loss of those villi can lead to malabsorption, and that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, just think about if you didn't have your villi, your bowel segment would be so humongously large because you would need just insane amounts of, um, of surface area. I believe it's something like, I want to say like 12,000 feet long is what your bowel would need to be if you didn't have any villi uh, just to match that same surface area. Uh, so just a fun fact that no one needed to know, but you learned something today. So celiac disease, uh, we all know it's a gluten-sensitive enteropathy, but specifically it's a component of gluten. Gluten is a pretty large protein, uh, but the component of it that celiac disease is concerned with is gliadin. Um, so it's an autoimmune intolerance of gliadin. So if you see a test question and it's talking, it's, you recognize, oh, this is celiac disease the answer choice gluten it's not there you're probably looking for the word gliadin because that's a more specific um, description of what it is so obviously you have the malabsorptive symptoms that we talked about and you also have um, these associations that kind of silly to have to know but step one wants to ask about them so just remember hla dq2 and dq8 um, are associated with celiac disease uh, some demographics, uh, Northern European and more females are affected than males. And then really high yield point here to mention is dermatitis or pediformis has a 100% association between uh, celiac disease and um, dermatitis or pediformis. So, if, so classically how this would present in a board exam or a test question would be if you're getting this patient who has malabsorptive symptoms, diarrhea, steatorrhea, chronic weight loss, and then they also present with these weird vesic vesicular lesions sort of diffusely throughout their body, um, those two things tied together should really like slam dunk celiac disease right there. Uh, basically what's being caused is you have these IgA deposits that are at the tips of your dermal papillae, which cause dermatitis or pediformis. So it can be a very high yield way to a slam dunk a question if they're talking about malabsorptive symptoms and then this weird vesicular lesion that no one can figure out what it is. Um, all right. And then you also have increased risk of malignancy, specifically T cell lymphomas, but also other ones. Uh, this is kind of just a trend whenever you have chronic inflammation anywhere, um, you can have increased risk of cancer. And that's just sort of a trend in all your body symptoms, and that carries over here as well. Uh, question. Yes, there is IgA deposition at the tips of your dermal papillae, which is what um, causes dermatitis or pediformis. All right. <clears throat> so serologic testing for it is probably really high yield as well. There's sort of two antibodies, there's anti-endomycial and anti-TTG or tissue transglutaminase. Antibodies, they're both very specific and sensitive to uh, celiac disease. The problem, though, is that you have to be on a gluten-containing diet at the time that you are testing these antibodies. If you're not on a gluten-containing diet when you test these, sensitivity and specificity just plummet to the core of the earth. Um, so, and then after you stop your gluten-containing diet, these also normalize within a couple months. Um, so someone could have celiac disease, and as long as it's controlled and they're not taking gluten in their diet, their serologies could be completely normal. Um, so again, just keep that in mind. Um, this can present on your board exam questions as well, uh, where they're mentioning someone with celiac who hasn't been on a gluten diet at all for years. What's their serology is going to be? Um, so... And then really the gold standard is a small intestinal biopsy. And you go into the duodenal bulb and your proximal duodenum, and what you see is villus atrophy and crypt hyperplasia. 
And you can also see intraepithelial lymphocytosis, and that's what we start to see here. So this is your epithelium here, and as you can see, they're just lymphocytes all throughout this epithelium. And they really shouldn't be there. And we'll show you a picture here later that shows your normal vellus tips. Uh, so these are pretty specific and sensitive for celiacs, but also not necessarily, uh, and we'll get to that. So the d xylose test, I've never heard of it being used in real life, but I swear to God, UWorld loves asking about this, and board exams love asking about it. But just remember about this, basically what the xylose test is, and it's not specific or sensitive for celiac, but it is sort of sensitive for malabsorptive symptoms that you can clinically correlate. So it's basically just pass, xylose is passively absorbed in your small intestines, and then your blood and urine levels uh, should decrease with mucosa defects because you won't be absorbing as much of it if you have mucosa defects. Um, and um, that's pretty much uh, all that you should know about it. These are normal in pancreatic deficiencies. You're probably going to talk about it more with pancreatic deficiencies when you cover that pathology. Um, but basically, these do not need any pancreatic enzymes to be absorbed. So if they're not being absorbed, your blood levels are going to be low, and this sort of points at some sort of um, villus or mucosa slash submucosa pathology. So this is a bit overwhelming. Uh, I just want to point out a couple of things here. So first of all, this mucosa you see here in this picture at the bottom, it's flat. There's no villi at all. This is a very bad progression of celiac disease or something else that's blunting your villi. Uh, so just wanted to point that out. And then here, don't worry about these classifications and all that crap. Uh, just sort of pay attention to what's going on here as this progresses. And these good normal villi, and you start getting these, um, as you can see here, all these lymphocytes are present inside your villi, which aren't as significant here. And then you start getting more hypercellularity inside your crypts. And then here you can see these villi are really blunting, especially from if we compare it to this first image here. And this fourth image, they're really blunted, and then they continue to blunt, and you get more hypercellularity inside your crypts. Uh, so just sort of pay attention to that progression. Don't worry about the nitty gritty details there. So one thing real quick about celiac disease to point out is that all of these things, you have to consider them as a whole. Your histologic findings aren't necessarily specific. Your serologic testings aren't necessarily sensitive. So you really have to take the entire clinical picture into context and consider all the other things that could be causing these symptoms and then come to your conclusions. So again, correlate clinical features with um, your histologic and serologic findings. Um, so lactose intolerance, we all know about this. I'm not going to go into great detail with it, but just to point out, there's a congenital form, incredibly rare, like insanely rare. And this would present very similarly to other forms of um, congenital, uh, like galact essential galactosuria and galactosemia um, and all those inborn errors of metabolism. And it can present very similarly to those. Not really high yield, just wanted to point out that it's out there. And then there's the primary type, which we're all familiar with. Some of us probably have it here. Um, you basically have decreasing lactase as you age. And then there's a secondary type of lactose intolerance, and that's secondary to acute illness. And this is temporary. It's basically just when you have, let's say, a viral stomach bug and you kill a bunch of your, um, your GI epithelium and you temporarily have this lactose intolerance. Um, so diagnosis is obviously, it's just presumptive. Like if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's probably a duck. But you can do this confirmatory test if you're in the hospital of board exams. Uh, it's the hydrogen breath test, very specific, or very sensitive for lactose intolerance. Um, don't worry about this little value here. But one thing that's super high yield that I want to point out for lactose intolerance is that on board exams and on your exams, people love to try to trick you and they're not gonna write. So you're reading the stem question stem, and you're like, oh yeah, this is obviously lactose intolerance, and you get down to the answer choices, and lactase is not an answer choice. So lactase, as you 
might recall is a disaccharidase. So in your answer choice, you might see disaccharidase deficiency. That's basically just talking about lactase deficiency. You might also see brush border enzyme deficiency because this is a brush border enzyme. So again, just remember disaccharidase deficiency and brush border enzyme deficiency uh, are other ways that someone could refer to lactase deficiency because just putting lactase deficiency in an answer choice is way too easy and we would all recognize it right away. So just real quick, tropical sprue, uh, very similar presentation to celiac sprue, but this one responds to antibiotics. Uh, I don't have a whole lot else to say about it. It's popular or not popular, it's prevalent in tropics. So whether someone's visited there recently or lives there. Um, otherwise, again, very similar histological features with villus atrophy and upper hyperplasia. You kind of just have to take the whole context into, um, into account, except these, also, these respond to antibiotics typically. So then Whipple's disease is the next thing we're gonna mention here real quick. Yeah, I believe there's another, there's supposed to be a separate lecture on GI bugs, but I just wanted to throw this in here because it's a cause of malabsorptive symptoms and that's what we're talking about here. Uh, so it's Trophorema Whippli infection um, and it can present chronically as malabsorption, obviously diarrhea, weight loss, abdominal pain, etc. Uh, but you can also have a lot of weird features. You can have cardiac symptoms like heart blocks or arrhythmias. Um, you can get a lot of musculoskeletal features like weird um, arthralgias. And you can also have neurologic findings um, as well. And basically the high yield points I want you to remember from this though is these are PAS positive uh, staining um, so these macrophages are PAS positive. That's like the classic slam dunk board question for this one. And they're also quote unquote foamy macrophages inside your lamina propria. So if you remember anything from this, just remember PAS positive. And what PAS does is the stain just detects glycoproteins. Um, so yeah, that's all I want you to remember from this if you take anything away from it. So ischemic bowel disease, and we're not gonna talk, spend a whole lot of time on this, mostly because You've all done CRR, you're familiar with the causes of like atherosclerosis and ischemia and um, all that jazz. So you've got, obviously you got a bunch of these causes that we're all familiar with. Basically anything that increases your chances of forming blood clots um, and atherosclerosis can also cause ischemic bowel disease. Um, one thing I do want to mention though is bringing these back to anatomy first year is there's the watershed area which is your splenic flexure. That's sort of the transition period be between where your inferior and superior mesenteric arteries supply blood to your colon. Uh, that area is most susceptible to involvement with ischemic bowel disease. And one thing as well to point out is just some, um, obviously this occurs in older people who've had time to develop these um, atherosclerosis and then more common in females. And then clinical presentation especially postprandial uh, abdominal pain. And this is important to recognize because normally if there's no food in your stomach, your body's not shunting that much blood to your bowel because it doesn't need it there. But when you have, when you're postprandial, obviously you're shunting a lot of blood to your bowel uh, to digest that food. And in this case, your supply and demand for oxygen uh, finds a mismatch postprandially, and that's when you get this abdominal pain. And chronically, you also get weight loss um, and hematochesis and diarrhea. So again, not a whole lot to say here. It should be pretty self-explanatory. It's very similar to ischemia of the heart and basically any other organ that you've learned so far this year. And then outcomes are pretty bad uh, with ischemic bowel disease, 10% um, mortality in the first month. So an inflammatory bowel disease. So these are really high yield. There's two of them, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Um, some epidemiology, it's usually in younger people that it presents uh, like adolescents to younger adults. Um, gender, it's almost one-to-one, -one, but slightly more female predominance. And then there is a genetic susceptibility that's not fully understood uh, to one-fourth of the people uh, involved have a first-degree relative who's also affected. And we're going to talk about all of these in much more detail here. 
the pathogenesis, uh, very multifactorial, but really what I want to highlight here is it's an aberrant immune response, especially, um, essentially, is what's going on. And then you also have increased risk of colon cancer. As we talked about, any chronic inflammatory process is going to lead to increase the risk for cancer. So Crohn's disease, there's actually two types of it, and I'm surprised these aren't mentioned in uh, a lot of your materials as often as I think they should be, because they're fairly distinct. So there's an inflammatory pattern of Crohn's disease, and as one might imagine with inflammation, you have fever, abdominal pain, diarrhea, and sometimes bleeding. But then the other pattern for it is fibrostenotic, and this is just mostly obstructive symptoms. So things like chronic constipation or even just overt intestinal obstruction um, can result from it. So, okay, so we're going to talk about a lot of high-yield slam dunks here. Um, and Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, like, they're not difficult. If you know the difference between them, like the test questions should all just be easy slam dunks, just easy money. So again, all of these are just easy money findings. So Crohn's disease, your gross anatomical findings, um, mostly right-sided involvement. It does spare your rectum typically, um, at least in comparison to the to ulcerative colitis, as we'll see here. So again, right side predominance. Transmural involvement. So it involves your mucosa, submucosa, all the way through your muscularis, basically all the layers of your bowel. And this becomes really important because some of the other sequelae of Crohn's disease will make more sense if you remember that it's transmural involvement. So it's both the inside and the outside of your bowel that's being affected. Um, and this can manifest as creeping fats or fat wrapping. And it's basically your adipose from your mesentery. It's basically stuck uh, onto your um, your bowel, and we'll show you a picture here. So it's also segmental involvement. Um, it's uh, skip lesions is sort of the buzzword for this. Oh yeah, there skip lesions is the buzzword for this. And there's two sort of other buzzwords here. There's serpentine ulcers, which are basically just longitudinal ulcers. And then there's cobblestone, which I'll show you a picture of. Um, but remember those serpentine ulcers, cobblestone, skip lesions, all buzzwords for Crohn's disease. So strictures, as we mentioned, um, these are uncommon, but there is a type of or a pattern of Crohn's disease that can present as mainly fibrostenotic in strictures. And then you get fissures from this. I'll um, show you a picture of that as well. And fistulates. So fistulae are very common in Crohn's disease. Um, and if you think about it, if you're having just the inside of your bowel that's inflamed, it makes sense why fistulas might not be that common. But if it's also the outside that's inflamed, that outside of the bowel can be in contact with your bladder or some other lumen. Um, and if it's inflamed, then you're going to have cellular breakdown and the aberrant connections that lead to fistula. So that's where this transmural involvement really becomes important is with fistula development. Okay, so right here we see these longitudinal ulcers or these serpentine ulcers. Uh, that's kind of what that was talking about. And the right two images, what we see here is cobblestone. Um, not a whole lot to say here. It's a pretty classic picture, classic buzzword. You're going to see it in you will. You're probably going to see it uh, on some exams at some point. Uh, so just remember these buzzwords here for Crohn's disease. All right. So just some more pictures here. So just to orient you a little, this is your small intestines, and here it's progressing that way. So if you pay attention here, you can see your lumen just suddenly narrows, almost a complete um, obstruction here. It's incredibly stenosed. You have a stricture that's causing you almost zero passage of, um, of material from one side of the lumen to the other side. And then what you also see here is if you pay attention, there's actually this adhesion between these two bowel loops. They're basically stuck together, and that's where um, the transmural involvement comes in. If this gets inflamed long enough and stays there long enough, you can actually have a fistula between the two bowel loops. Fistulas aren't necessarily between bowel and something else. They can be between two bowel loops themselves as well. Uh, and as you see here, there's skip lesions. There's involvement here. 
not much involvement there, and then a bunch of involvement here, and then again, not much involvement there, so just remember that as well. So then just some more creeping fat. As you can see, this fat is really stuck on to this, um, this valve up here. It really shouldn't look like this. It should look a little bit more like this. Or if you remember from first year, uh, there is obviously a bunch of fat in your abdomen, but it's not embedded or like almost continuous with your, with your colon, except in Crohn's disease because of the transmural involvement and that results in the creeping. All right, and it's um, mainly a Th1 mediated process as that one might imagine with Th1 mediated processes. If you remember something from immunology, you have non caseating granulomas. Um, so it's kind of hard to tell here, but you have a bunch of these granulomas around. Um, and again, they're non caseating. Caseating granulomas, you're thinking more of something like tuberculosis or an infectious process. Whereas non caseating, you're thinking more of an autoimmune process like Crohn's disease or sarcoidosis, etc. And then here, what you see is this crypt abscess that also occur with Crohn's disease. And you have a bunch of this inflammatory neutrophil um, infiltrate inside it. So just some more Crohn's disease stuff. So this is the transmural involvement. Um, as you can see here, there's all this proteinaceous uh, inflammatory material inside all these layers of your, uh, of your epithelium here. And I'll draw your attention here real quick. So notice this ulcer in here on, the, on this right image. Uh, so this is what the fissuring ulceration is called. If you compare this to the left side of the picture, uh, you can see there's not much ulceration here, uh, maybe a little bit here. But really here, you can tell there's just a huge glob of that uh, epithelium just missing. And here as well, you can see this epithelium that's fissuring just all the way inside. So this is sort of classic for Crohn's disease as well. All right, so just some extra intestinal manifestations of Crohn's disease, and this is shared with ulcerative colitis, this list. So skin involvement, you have pyoderma granulosum, erythema nodosum. Uh, we don't have a lot of time here, so I'm not going to go into much detail here. Uh, oh, so there's a question. Crohn's occurs throughout the entire GI tract, right? Can these fissures and strictures occur higher up? So good question. Uh, absolutely, they can occur. Basically, anywhere that Crohn's disease is involving. So I know we're talking about the lower GI tract, but Crohn's can also affect your upper GI tract and cause all of these same symptoms up there as well. So you can get strictures, obstructions, uh, fissuring ulcerations, but they're more common in your lower GI tract. I'm not sure anyone knows exactly why, but these can occur in your upper GI tract as well. So good question. I just didn't mention all of those because this is quote unquote a lower GI pathology lecture, but yeah. So other um, manifestations, uveitis and episcleritis, um, is in this inflammation of those structures. Uveitis is incredibly dangerous, acute, very acute process. And then here you can have aphthous ulcers, which sort of goes back to your question there. You also have ulcerations basically in your mouth. Those are very common with inflammatory bowel disease, actually. Mouth ulcers with both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. And musculoskeletal system, you can also have ankylosing spondylitis um, and mesacroiliitis, or just also diffuse uh, joint pains. But one thing I want to point out is extra intestinal manifestations. So you can get kidney stones and gallstones. And one might be wondering why would you get kidney stones and gallstones with Crohn's disease? Uh, we're going to talk about this because this is a very high yield board exam concept. They love asking about this. I can 100% guarantee this will show up in the world. This will show up on your NBME, your world self-assessment practice exams. This might show up on your end of unit. This most likely will show up on your board exam in some form or fashion. So gallstones are easy to uh, conceptualize why they occur. Basically, your terminal ileum is involved. Crohn's disease, right? Classic site of involvement. And that's where your bile acid is reabsorbed. So you basically don't have bile acid reabsorption. If you don't have bile acid reabsorption, there's less um, bile acid to emulsify those cholesterols um, and other things, and it can form stones. But kidney stones, this is more um, 
more difficult to conceptualize sometimes. So if you remember, you have the bile acid reabsorption, which is impaired, and that leads to impaired fat absorption because that's what bile acids help you absorb. They help you absorb fat. If you have impaired fat absorption, you have more intraluminal fat or more fat inside your gut not being absorbed. If you have more of intraluminal fat, calcium actually binds that fat. So calcium binds that fat. Your intraluminal calcium binds that fat and is excreted. The problem you result in, though, is your, your body has plenty of ways to regulate calcium. You're not going to get hypocalcemia from this, most likely, unless it's very severe. But the problem you have is that free oxalate normally binds calcium in your GI tract. So now that you've excreted this calcium in your fat, which leaves your body via like steatorrhea, um, your free oxalate is not uh, bound with calcium. And instead, your free oxalate is absorbed into your bloodstream in increased quantities. And basically what that results in is more oxalate being excreted in your urine to try to balance that out. And if you'll remember from CRR, Calcium oxalate is a very, very common, I think it might actually be the most common kidney stone. Um, so calcium oxalate stones form. So obviously you're always excreting some calcium in your urine. Um, and then you have more oxalate being excreted, disproportionately more. And that can result in kidney stones, specifically calcium oxalate stones. So I know that's a lot of logical steps to come to calcium oxalate stones, but it's very important that you recognize this and know why it occurs. So if this doesn't make sense to you, feel free to reach out to me or just um, read through this again on your own time after this, because it's important that you recognize why these kidney stones occur. It ties together a lot of um, physiology from renal as well as GI, as well as like your compatibility system. Those are the types of questions board examiners love to ask. It's things that are involving multi-systems and you have to really conceptualize all these different things going on. So very high yield concept. I cannot emphasize enough how high yield this is. If it shows up on your URL, send me a text or an email in like three or four months and let me know because it was on mine. Probably shouldn't have said that. Um, all right, so more high yield slam dunks for uh, for ulcerative colitis. So, so when you take your step one, you sign like this confidentiality form that says you're not going to talk about any questions that were on your exam, which is why I said I probably shouldn't have said that. Um, all right, so ulcerative colitis, again, a bunch of slam dunks here. So instead of right-sided involvement, this is left-sided involvement. Um, and classically, you have rectal involvement. You don't necessarily have this with Crohn's disease. You can but not necessarily, but ulcerative colitis classically involves your rectum. Uh, and then you can have other involvement of your colon, but not necessarily, but your rectum always involved. So then there's diffuse involvement, meaning there's no skip regions. You don't have like area of normal and then abnormal area and then an area of normal. So this is pan colitis. If it involves an area, it involves the entire area between those two boundaries. So then it's mainly mucosal involvement and there's not transmural inflammation. And this is important because you don't get uh, fistulae and the creeping fat and all those symptoms of Crohn's disease that one might expect with transmural inflammation. That's not to say that ulcerative colitis isn't a horrible disease. It is awful, um, but you don't have to worry about those involvements usually. So active disease, you have these broad, aka flask-shaped ulcers. That's a very classic um, buzzword or board exam question there. You also get pseudopolyps to show you a picture of that. But then chronic involvement is more, um, I wouldn't say benign because it's still bad, but it's more histologically benign. There's not that much going on with it. You basically just have flat mucosa, atrophic, etc. So, okay, so as you can see here, you have this very distinct border uh, of involvement so here. You have this entire area that's involved, and you have this entire area that's normal. So no skip lesions at all. And then you have these pseudopolyps here as well. And then you also get these weird mucosal bridging since it's mainly 
mucosal involvement. It doesn't involve your muscular layers or outside layers. But in just some histologic pictures of it, you have, again, clipped abscesses with these, um, you have all this inflammatory material inside there. We get this ulceration. So this is a little bit different from Crohn's disease. So if you kind of use your imagination here, this sort of looks like an Erlenmeyer flask on the right side of this picture. And that's your ulcer or your flask-shaped ulcer that people are talking about with uh, these images. So then um, this lead pipe appearance is also a buzzword for um, ulcerative colitis. And basically what it's talking about is you have this loss of your hostra. So if you pay attention here, you have all these hostra that you can see at the top of this colon. But when you get down here to where it's involved, it just looks like a lead pipe. There's no hostra at all. It's loss of your hostra. And uh, one thing I also want to point out about this image, this is going to really uh, make you look smart uh, next year on, uh, on wards. Um, you should be able to tell that this patient is laying down in this image. And you can tell based on the contrast here, this person is laying down on their side, which is why this contrast has all these um, very distinct uh, borders here, a very distinct pattern. Uh, they're just laying on their side off to you. All right, so question, do these mucosal bridges result in increased risk of bowel obstruction? Um, honestly, I am not sure. I don't know. I have no idea. Um, I think it's more of a histologic, just a histologic finding. I'm not honestly sure of the significance of it or if it increases the risk of bowel obstruction or adhesion if it's possible. I, mean, I honestly don't know. Sorry about that. So some more extraintestinal manifestations. We've already talked about these. These are shared with Crohn's disease. But some things unique to ulcerative colitis is there's an association between ulcerative colitis and primary sclerosing cholangitis. We're not going to talk about this disease here. You should cover it in hepatobiliary. I don't know if you've already had that chapter, but you should have talked about it there if you haven't had it. And it's also associated with P. anca. If you remember, there's more PNK associations besides ulcerative colitis and primary sclerosis cholangitis um, from CRR. So just remember, old things come back, and things that have multi-system involvement are very high use for boards. All right, so this is just a quick picture of toxic medical, and it can occur in both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and also it can be caused by infections like C. diff. Um, and then just quickly reviewing, so Crohn's disease, remember, this thing of the R stands for right-sided, segmental, transmural, um, and then some buzzwords like cobblestoning, strictures, and fistulae. And then ulcerative colitis, uh, left-sided, diffuse with no skip lesions, mucosal mainly, and you have pseudopolyps, but you don't have fistulae, strictures, and fissures. Um, you can look at this in more detail on your own time, but just some antibody testing for this. Um, so there's a very clear distinction between this. So there is the anti-sacromyces cervicii antibody or YASCA, and then there's your PNCA. And these are both in UWorld, they're both in first aid, so it's definitely worth knowing these. So there's two patterns. So if you have a positive anti-sacromyces Saccharomyces cerevisiae antibody, and a negative pianca that's very specific for Crohn's disease. Again, not necessarily sensitive, but it's very specific for Crohn's disease. Similarly, if you have a negative anti-saccharomyces antibody and a positive pianca, very specific for ulcerative colitis, not necessarily sensitive though. So remember the difference there. So just know this right here. This is high yield, it can be a slam dunk for you on exams, you know that. So just real quick, hemorrhoids, um, there's not a whole lot to say about these, but very common, 5% of the general population. The older you get, the more common they are. Uh, they're basically just due to increased pressure within your hem hemorrhoidal plexus. Uh, risk factors are just chronic constipation, excess straining. Now you can also have venous stasis in pregnancy, which We'll probably cover here 
coming up, I believe, if you haven't already. Uh, so there's two types. There's an internal and an external hemorrhoid. One's above uh, from your superior plexus, one's from your inferior plex plexus below the anorectal, or uh, I think it's also called the pectinate. Um, yeah, it's also called the pectinate gland, according to this image. Um, but if you're going to take away anything from this, uh, it's a really quick and easy way to, uh, that I conceptualize this. If you're thinking of internal hemorrhoids, they're going to bleed, but they're not going to be painful, usually. And that's because they're on this side, on they're on the internal side of your anal canal, meaning they're innervated by your autonomic nervous system. And aside from vague discomforts, you don't really feel pain um, from your autonomic nervous system as discreetly as you would from your somatic or skeletal muscular system. So internal hemorrhoids, they're prone to bleed, but they're not necessarily painful. They can be painful, but um, in comparison, not necessarily as painful. So again, internal tend to bleed, but not as painful. Whereas external, they tend to thrombose, is what you see here in this picture. And they're very painful because they're actually innervated by your somatic or your skeletal nervous system. Um, as you can see in this image here, they're sort of coming off the, you can even see it's coming off the skeletal or your somatic uh, nervous system here. So they're very painful, they tend to thrombose, whereas internal are not as painful and they tend to bleed. So very quick and easy way to remember it. Um, that's pretty much the only thing I knew about hemorrhoids going into step one, and that's all you really needed. So peritoneal disease, just real quick, peritonitis, I think we all know, obviously, just inflammation of peritoneum can be caused by a whole bunch of things, infections, enzymatic leaks, bio leaks, foreign material, uh, basically anything causing inflammation inside your abdominal viscera. But uh, peritoneal disease itself, there's mesothelioma, and actually a big chunk of mesotheliomas are primarily in your peritoneum. So it's important to recognize that peritoneal cancer is not necessarily a metastasis. It can be due to seeding or hematogenous uh, neoplastic uh, spread, um, but not necessarily. You can also have primary peritoneal mesothelioma, which is a cancer of peritoneum. Uh, so pseudomyxoma peritonei, uh, there's a lot of words here. Uh, I just wanted to sort of mention this, I think you're going to cover it more in detail when you do some of the reproductive cancers. Um, but just remember, you can have um, pseudomyxoma peritonei, which is basically just a bunch of gross uh, gelatinous mucinous material. So any like mucinous cancer um, can cause this and it's quote unquote jelly belly. It's basically just a bunch of gelatinous material inside your peritoneum. Not a whole lot else to say about it. Uh, there's certain cancers that can predispose to it, um, but I'll let you discover those when you get to the reproductive cancers. Um, so that's pretty much all I have for you. Uh, I don't really have much else to say here. Hopefully you found that helpful. I tried to keep it relevant to your board exams and high yield material because I know how frustrating it can be when professors don't do that. So again, let me know if you have any questions. Feel free to email, text me, or type it in the chat here. Um, oh yeah, so these slides were a bit different from what's posted on D2L. I'll send in these updated slides to them um, so that they can post it and update it on D2L. I added some things, um, so it sounds good. All right, again, let me know if you have any questions. Feel free to reach out if you ever need anything. And as always, have a good weekend and keep it high yield.